Good evening. Uh, welcome to Art Say UNH, uh, where we interview writers that come to our reading series here at the University of New Haven. I'd like to welcome you all today. Um, our guest today is Tayemba Jess, and I will just read you a little bit of Tayemba's bio. Tayemba is a Detroit native. Uh, his first book of poetry, Lead Belly, was a winner of the 2004 National Poetry Series. The Library Journal and Black Issues Book Review both named it one of the best poetry books of 2005. Jess, a Kavi Khanum and a New York University alumni, received a 2004 Literature Fellowship from the National Endowment of the Arts and was a 2004-05 Winter Fellow at the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. Jess is also a veteran of the 2000 and 2001 Green Mill Poetry Slam team and won a 2000-2001 Illinois Art Council Fellowship in Poetry. Uh, Jess is an assistant professor of English at, co of, at College of Staten Island. We'd like to welcome Tayama Jess. Welcome, man. Thank you for bringing me out. <laughs> Good to have you here. Good to have you here. Um, uh, first of all, I want to get into the, the sort of the, the book Lead Belly, which sort of has become a seminal book um, within um, literature. I like to think that within the, Amer uh, the landscape of American literature. Um, talk about sort of, you know, and we've been looking at that book in our class, uh, Intro to Creative Writing, um, and the forums class. So it would be interesting. Uh, my students wanted to know. So what you know, what was the genesis for that project, um, the Lead Belly, which is a sort of an historical project, correct? Yeah. Uh, I guess the genesis was that uh, I've I've always been a, a a lover of the blues, right? And Lead Belly not is not exactly a blues player, so to speak. He was not exactly. Uh, uh, he was more located in the uh, in the folk tradition than he was in the blues tradition. Tradition, mm -hmm. but he was. He's kind of like a cornerstone that in American folk music that branches off into blues, so to speak. Right. So I I uh, read a uh, a book called The Life and Legend of uh, Lead. Lead Belly mm -hmm. uh, by, I think a guy, his name is Kip Kelly. I can't remember exactly his name right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it was a very, you know, straightforward, well-written book about, uh, about lead. And uh, what I, I, I just started to write these, these poems about lead. And uh, the first one that was written was when he was uh, being chased after, after prison escape. And he went into the Red River, mm -hmm. and a dog followed him, and he and he drowned the dog, and the sheriff was like that close to shooting him, <laughs> right. you know. So, um, and so it just kind of grew and grew and grew after that. And to make a long story short, uh, what I discovered about his life, which was roughly 1885 to 1949, is right. that it it covered. Uh, so many different themes: uh, African American relationship to prison industrial complex. Exactly. Uh, to uh, the recording industry, anthropology, the Great Migration. There was a love story in, in, involved in it. Mm -hmm. There was this, this internal struggle that he had uh, in order to get, gain control over his temper and his 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 uh, his anger in order to control himself and control his music and his destiny. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know uh, that was that was all of those things combined, uh, and also the idea that he was he's the, he's a person located just at the edge of myth and, and fact. You know, right, a lot of people... Right, the intersection of myth and fact, right. almost like a Robert Johnson in a right. way, right? exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, the, the people had these, uh, had these, and I had these misconceptions about, about Lead Belly that, mm -hmm. that I, I really wanted to figure out what, how true right. they were, and I really wanted to mm -hmm. uh, ground the book in the actual historical fact as much as I possibly yeah. could. I can remember actually reading that book, and I remember the historic, the historical facts in it was sort of. And I tell my students, you know, part of it is, is teaching you. You're getting the best of creative writing, and you're getting this history lesson at the same time. And uh, one of the things I want to say, while working in persona, for those out there in the audience who don't know, uh, persona is when um, the writer or the author assumes the voice of someone else. Um, when you assume, when you, when, at what point did you sort of feel like, yeah, I got Lead Belly's voice, you know? <laughs> you know, I know there's always well, a moment, I think, uh, because, you know, when I was working a persona, I remember that moment or that, uh, you know, when I begin to feel close to what yeah. I was doing, like I was all in then, you know? Yeah, uh, you know, originally the entire book was just going to be in Lead Belly's voice. And then I got, after about 20, 20 30 poems in, I was like, I, th I thought that, I, I needed to break off, and so I started doing uh, objects and people around him. Right. Um, but I, 
there was a point where I decide where I had to kind of step back and say, okay, how much of this there there's this this uh, this suspension of disbelief that happens when you're when you're reading the poems and in, in that you know uh, what you what you're hearing is the voice of what Lead Belly might have been thinking at a particular time, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to lend it a certain degree of authenticity without. And without stretching like you know, the uh, the vocabulary too far out right. of what what yeah. what might have been his yeah. his supposed range and, right. and, and remaining true to his character, so to right. speak. I think you do that. So I mean, it reminds me. You know, I look at Zora Neale Hurst's book. I don't know if you've ever heard. Every tongue got to speak. Yeah. And it's sort of like you know, sort of the guy to that vernacular that, you know, so that's one of the things when you're in persona, you always got to stay true to the time, right. the language. Right. I mean, so make it believable and make it real, you know. Right. Yeah. So it, was, it involved a lot of research and, and just trying to, uh, you know, there were times I had to, I had to, you know, okay, bring it back, Jess, bring it back <laughs> right. just a little bit, just a little too tangled up, you know. Right, right. And then right. I had other times where I, I, I feel like I... Right. I got it. Yeah. So it was, all, it was always a balancing act, you know. Yeah. All, and I, I know time. one of the things I just look before we move on, um, the idea of titles. And you know, for young creative writers, I can remember I can actually remember this, you know, um, me and you were dialogue dialoguing about my manuscript and, and one of the things I remember you talking about is being clear in your titles and your titles have to sort of tell the story. Um how did you come about? I mean, how does that work for you? I mean, because I think right. you do it really well. Because I tell people all the time, if you look at the titles, it sort of tells you can you can get a narrative within that. Itself, right. Right. You know, I think that that the way I I looked at titles, particularly for Lead Belly, was mm -hmm. to do to solve a certain problem, which was to locate the reader at a certain time, a certain place, and to kind of get an idea of the tone of what was going to happen. So. Um, that therein is where I develop my my idea about about what the the function of title should should perform. If we're a different book, right? It would be a different scenario, right? But I just but, thought, yeah, for that you needed the time, I, you needed the clarity, right? Of what was happening, who was speaking, what right. was going on, exactly. Because there's just, yeah. there's really specific things ha that are happening, mm -hmm. and then the section titles as well were uh, were based off of uh, songs, right? Of his, okay. so I wanted to be. To, to involve as much of him into the project as I possibly could. Okay, very good. Yeah. Now I want to sort of, you know, segue into your, your latest project, which is Olio, right? I'm not yes. Gonna, but before, before we get there, I want to talk about, um, you just recently did a TED talk in Nashville, which I yeah. find very interesting, um, very informative. Um, and it's based on the McCoy sisters. I was wondering, could you tell our audience a little bit about that and, you know, mm -hmm. how did you sort of come into that? But also the syncopated sonnets and, mm -hmm. you know, that whole idea. Well, the McCoy sisters, to, to start off, were uh, conjoined twins. They were joined back to back, mm -hmm. roughly. Um, right. And uh, they were born, I want to say, 1849, 1850 or mm -hmm. so, in right. slavery right. Uh, in uh, North Carolina. And uh, they were, their, their master uh, resolved that the best way that he was going to make a profit off of them was to put them in a, rent them out on a freak show circuit at right. the age of around two right. or so. And so they were circulated on this freak show circuit in which uh, they were, every time they went to a new town, they were inspected, you know, anatomically inspected, you know, over and over right. and over and over and over again. Uh, yeah. And then they were kidnapped, taken to England, um, and they, and one of their other, one of the other co-leasers, because they were rented out a couple in a couple of different ways. One of the other uh, co-leasers went to England with their mother over to England, got them and brought them back. And at that time, slavery had had been abolished in England, right. and the mother had to make the decision as to whether or not she was going to stay with them or go or go she back home back, to the United States. Home. She came back, yeah. brought them Which home. It's an interesting thing within itself. It is, know? it yeah. is. A uh, very difficult decision to make. And uh, later on, after the Civil War, uh, they, after, when they gained their emancipation, they became, they continued on the freak show circuit, but on, under their own terms. In other words, they had an affidavit that explained that they actually were conjoined twins and that they no, no longer had to go through these inspections, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so they 
kind of they gained age a certain degree of agency over themselves right and right. they they were be, became really big stars right, right, right. so um my in in writing about them i wanted to uh express the kind of uh, uh that conjoinedness and that uh and that that unique voice that they had so mm -hmm. what i tried to do was to uh develop I, I worked with sonnets because i wanted to uh i wanted to work with a kind of uh poetic form that they would they would have been more familiar with. In other right. words, sonnets were really big yeah, in the exactly. 19th century and exact exactly. sonnets, exactly. you know, you know, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, F, G, G. Right, right, right. And so um, uh, I had previously done some work around uh, a gentleman named B Blind Tom. And uh, while writing these syncopated sonnets, is what I just decided to call, call them, was two sonnets side by side that talk to each other right. and run back and forth. Right. And, and, right. And you have one persona on one side and the other persona on the other side. I kind of had a, a, a revelation working with those, and I and I and that was probably when the idea because I I kind of knew about the McCoy twins, mm -hmm. but when I discovered that I could make a make a sonnet that spoke back and forth, I thought, well, right. and, I, and, I just, and I just want to preface this for our for our viewers that you had you had previously worked. Sort of like that with the contrapuntal in Lead Belly. Yes. Assuming low maxes and Lead Belly's voices and sort of intertwining yes. those with, you know, with letters and, and things like that. So. Yeah. So I, I had done I had done some work like that in Lead Belly, but I wanted to really what I really decided I, I wanted to really explore it as far as I knew how to explore the idea of contrapuntal mm -hmm. poems, and so that's what I did. I uh, I developed a, a kind of a a, a, a a form that's a, a, a contrapuntal sonnet, syncopated sonnet, and then I developed their story within uh, using the concept of a of a of a crown of sonnets, right. which forms a circle, and ex instead forming a, a, a something that looks kind of like an X, mm -hmm. where the two you can imagine the head and the feet of each sister on right. on either side. Right. So. Um, and you can read the story down and up and all, all the way through, mm -hmm. whichever direction you, you choose to uh, choose to travel. And um, I, you know, I I think that um, you know sometimes ideas come out of uh, desperation. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. You know, you're desperate. You got to. And you're your... thinking, what? How am I right. going to to yeah. make this? Yeah. How am I going to tell these these folks' story? How am I going to make this original to them? It's and interesting. That's where it always starts. It most always starts out like that. And, and sometimes, and then you right. sort of figure it out as you go. You right, know? right. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Um, but yeah, and I say, and, and so that sort of segues into your, 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 your latest project or the, 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 the latest book that will be coming out sometime in the near future, but it's almost complete. And um, I've seen, I've had a chance to read with you, and I've seen, you know, you read plenty of times of, some of the things that's going on. So, for the for the for the viewers that don't know, talk about talk about what Olio necessarily means, and then go into the idea of what this book is about because it deals with persona as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Olio, uh, aside from in the Italian meaning oil, uh, means right. was the middle part of a minstrel show. Right. Uh, in that uh, it was the, the the variety act of the minstrel show, and. <clears throat> Later on, the when the minstrel show was essentially the, the the major form of entertainment in the 19th century. Um, so, if, for those not familiar, minstrel show was in 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 the, in the American sense was a, a form of entertainment where white folks would put on blackface right. and and perform caricatures of black people. Uh, and then uh, it, it was popular starting early part of the 19th century, all the way really up until the the middle part of the 20th century, so mm -hmm. more or less. Uh, and uh, after emancipation, um, it's the development was that more and more black people started to get involved in minstrelsy and, and, and uh, with dark face and without dark face, etc. But the Olio was the middle part. It was a variety show, so different kinds of acts would come on: musical acts, theatrical acts, right. torsionists, right. etc., 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 right. etc. And um, what I wanted to do was to have a multitude of voices uh, in the Olio, but telling their own story in, in, a, in a way that lent them dignity beyond 
the minstrel show trope of their period. So uh, I have Blind Tom, blind, a famous piano player, mm -hmm. Blind Boone, another famous piano player, Scott Joplin, who's right. the considered more or less the father of ragtime, right. uh, the McCoy twins, um, uh, uh, Sissy Retta Jones, first sister to sing in, in Carnegie Hall, really a little bit before it was Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Harry Burley is another person I've worked with who may or may not be in the book. That's, another, that's, a, that's a question. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, let me see. I'm, I'm forgetting all the... Uh, oh, the Fish Jubilee Singers. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, let me see. I, I'm, I'm probably forgetting a couple of people. Right. Uh, but, you but, make, but you make a good point, and I just want to interject this to, for people, uh, the, young, the young folks who are beginning to write and consider themselves writers. I'm almost sure that you just didn't, you know, that you had to sit down and sort of research these people. Oh, you had to figure yes. out what they do. And so it becomes this sort of thing where you're learning too. Exactly. Yeah. You can't teach, you can't write about these things if you don't know about them. And you have to do the research. And, and that's, and that's, the, that's, that's the thing about it. It took you how long to do Lev Bell? How, 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 well, that was five years. Right. Was, and, right. Five years. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, projects just don't happen. And so, you know, that's what I wanted to sort of, you know, you know hone in on it, that, you know, anything worth anything is going to take a little time. And you have to put the time into it. So. Right. But you got all these characters, man. And right. Um, and you know, the other, I guess the other part of that is that we often think about black American music, American music, et cetera, and inter black entertainment. Mm -hmm. But we are used to thinking of the entertainment that we have recorded either sonically or visually you mm -hmm. know and the, none of these people were recorded in that fashion in wow. other words there are no there are no audio recordings of blind boone or blind tom or this yes. or sissy Retta jones or or any of these people word of mouth uh, yeah, newspaper or, newspaper yeah. etc now there might be some uh, uh uh some player piano recordings of uh blind boone mm -hmm. and scott Joplin, yeah, right but that's about it gotcha. The rest of them, you know, there's, but what I'm what I'm really interested in is the is the is what was happening in the music before blues and jazz were marketed as such. You know wow. what I'm saying? Yeah. So you're talking, you no know, blues really wasn't marketed as blues until the 20th century. Same with right. and jazz yeah. wasn't really marketed as jazz until. 20th century, really Probably. the teens. Yeah, that's what I was getting right. ready to say. Really right about before, 100 years ago. Yeah, right, right before the Harlem Renaissance, you right. started seeing the beginnings of jazz a little bit, what they call in the jazz. In that They're way. calling it jazz, etc. Right. Before that, you have ragtime, you have there you go. coon you know, songs. Right, but sort of, you know, that sort of leads itself up to the jazz. And right, that, that makes exactly. Sense. right. exactly. Exactly. So that that really intrigued me, and I felt I felt a little, uh, I felt a little, uh, I felt a little, a little ignorant in that I had no real knowledge oh, right. yeah. of what was going on post-Civil uh, post War up until around 1917, which is the area that I'm, I'm dealing right, with. Right, right, and yeah. so all of these characters kind of started to poke their heads out and, yeah. at me and say, hey, what's up? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so I, 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 I wanted to listen to them and, and I've wanted to try and capture their story in some kind of, some kind of way. I oh, mean, you're the best person for the job. Well, thank you. Thank you man. <laughs> Tyama Jess, I want to thank you for coming to RCUNH. The first thank book you. is Lead Belly. The second one is Oleo. Um, you can go to YouTube and hear Tyama's uh, TED Talk in Nashville. I want to thank our audience for tuning in to RCUNH. And the next time you'll see us, we'll have sitting right here Martina Spada, um, the founders for the Pulitzer Prize and the Ooh. Latino port of his generation. Thank you so much. Ah.